right. So we're doing five. I'm less than four. We're continuing talking about an election. Last time we talked about who can vote and how states can make it harder or easier for somebody to vote in the United States. Today we're going to be focusing on presidential elections. But what I want you to realize is most of the things that we talk about today applies to most kinds of elections. Elections for congressmen, elections for senator, even state elections. A lot of these apply. Um, the thing is, I don't have printed copies for you all, and I'm going to go really fast. The important thing is understand, don't try to copy everything down because you're going to be left behind. What you need to do is jot things down that you feel like are going to be important, that you need to remember, uh, but you're going to be left behind if you try to copy things down. So all of these factors which we're going to talk about today affect presidential elections. Today we're going to talk about how you become president of the United States. But first of all, one of the factors is incumbency. You need to know this word. And usually during elections, there's two types of candidates. There's an incumbent and a challenger. The incumbent is the one trying to keep his seat, the one trying to get re-elected. So if you need a definition for incumbents, candidates seeking re-election. Candidates seeking re-election. In the United States, incumbents have a big advantage, especially when it comes to presidential elections. It is estimated that 80% of all presidents seeking re-election get re-elected. So Donald Trump, statistically, if he wants to run for president again in 2020, statistically, he's going to win. Because incumbents have severe advantage over their challengers, trying to unseat them or trying to take over the position they already hold. So what are these advantages? Number one, name recognition. People just recognize who the president is. So you, people and voters are more familiar with you and people tend to gravitate towards things that they're more familiar with. Number two, experience. You have experience being what? President. Being the president. You've dealt with other countries before, you've dealt with Congress so when it comes to the lawmaking process, so you've had experience trying to meet your agenda. And for a lot of voters, experience matters. Not only do you have experience being president of the United States, you also have experience running a successful campaign before. You've won before. You know what it takes to get those votes and to get voters to vote for you. So that's a big advantage for the incumbent. You have experience being president, which counts a lot for a lot of voters, and you have experience running a successful campaign. You've won the presidency before, you know what it takes. And lastly, something we talked about before, the bully pulpit. What's the bully pulpit? The bully pulpit refers to the attention given to the President of the United States by the media and by the public. We talked about how he can use his attention so that he can meet his policy agenda, so that he can accomplish whatever he sets out to accomplish by getting the people on his side. But he can also use this during elections. During elections, he can use the attention given to him. This is free attention, just for the fact that he's the one. He's a president of the United States, he gets this attention, and he can use that attention to appeal directly to the American voter. Does the challenger have that? All the cameras are pointing at Donald Trump, and everybody's looking at Donald Trump. He has the bully pulpit. He has the State of the Union address. He has the media. Um, ready to cover whatever he wants to do, whatever message that he wants to send, so he can take advantage of the bully pulpit to appeal to voters. Anybody have any questions? This is why the United States, incumbents have an advantage. They usually win elections, because they're given a lot of advantages. All right, let's talk about basic timeline of how you become president. The first thing you decide to run, there's a big commitment, because you're taking your family in the journey that they may not want to go to. Every single facet of your life will be scrutinized, it will be criticized, and you have to dedicate about two years of your life campaigning, which not a lot of people can do. Next, before you can actually participate in the November election, in the real elections, what do you need to win first? Your party's nomination. You want to become your party's nominee. The nominee of the party is the candidate that the party supports. Without a party nomination, in most states, you're not even put on the ballot. They have to write your name in if you're not a nominee for the party. You need your party support most of the time, especially which two parties. If you want to become the Republican nominee or the Democratic nominee. Otherwise, you do not have a chance. Real realistically, you don't have a chance. You need to get your party's nomination. And what that means is battling it out with other party members to achieve the party nomination. After that, we go to November and we have the Electoral College vote who becomes the next president of the United States, and then you get to be president. 
but things are a little bit more complicated than that. So let's talk about a calendar, election year. The spring and summer before the election year, which is right now, because next year we have a presidential election in 2020. Spring and summer, what you need to do is, if you're planning to be president of the United States, you need to announce, or you need to at least announce that you have the intentions of running. Right now, a lot of Democrats have already made their intention to run. They've already declared that they may be running or they're trying to get the Democratic nomination. If you don't announce your candidacy early, then you're falling behind. These guys already have a head start on you. The American public already know about these guys and they might not know about you. So you want to declare early, a year before the actual election, the spring and the summer of the actual election. And you're going to see more Democratic candidates are probably going to be declaring that they have an intention of running. That was good so far. All right, fast forward to 2020. Um, during January to about March, around there, um, the parties are going to hold their party elections. This is not the real elections, this is the election for the what? For a party nomination. So in each state, parties are going to be conducting party elections. The goal is to select who's going to be the nominee for the party. Is the work done? No, the work just begun. In the summer, in June or July, both parties will have what they call the party national convention. These are like pep rallies. The Democrats do one, the Republicans do one, and they do one in the summer. So summer 2020, this is what you can expect. And in that convention, at the end of the week, they're going to announce who's going to be their nominee for president and vice president. And then the real work begins. Because after beating down fellow party members to get the nomination, what else do you need to do afterwards? You need to campaign towards what? November. Because November is the real election. And this is when you need to beat the other party's nominee so that you can achieve the presidency. Anybody have any questions? So this is the basic timeline of the presidency. Today, we're not going to talk about how you become the actual president of the United States. Today, we're going to focus on this. We're going to focus on how you win your party's nomination. Because this is the first step. Without your party's nomination, you don't have a chance. So today is all about the nomination game. How do you become your party's nominee? Wait, sir. Um, yes. Like let's say for example the 2020 election. Uh -huh. Since Trump is gonna run again. As Usually a, he's automatically the nominee. They don't have to go through oh, the process. The Democrats to. will have to. Oh. And are they like formal elections? Like who's the party You'll see. Some of them are. Some of them are not. All right. So how do you become the nominee? There's one goal. So each party assigns a number of delegates for each state, usually depending on that party, or that state's what? Population. So each party is given or assigned a number of delegates that would attend the convention. And it depends on the state's population. The bigger state is, the more delegates you can send to the national convention in the summer. These delegates are the ones that actually vote on who's going to be the nominee for, for the presidency for the party, who's going to represent the party in the coming general presidential elections. So for example, this is the Republican delegate count. California, the most popular state of the union, has how many delegates up for grabs? They have 172 delegates that they can send to the national convention. And what good would be so far? So depending on how big your state is, that determines how many delegates are you able to send to the national convention, which is going to take place in the summer. The Democrats are the same thing, depending on the number of people you have. That's the number of delegates you can send. All right. The goal is you need to get, and this is important, and this is the goal of the nomination process, you need to get the majority of the delegates vote. You need to get the majority of the delegates Go. What is a majority? More than half. It's more than half. It's not just the most. You need to get more than half of delegates to vote for you. That's how you become the nominee of your party. So if you look at this previous example that I just showed you, to, to win the Democratic nomination, you're going to need 2,382 delegates to vote for you in the Democratic National Convention. What did Hillary Clinton get? She got 2,800. Is that enough or not enough? That's enough to become the nominee. That's why she became the Democratic nominee. 
Sanders only managed to get about 2,000 delegates to vote for him, which is pretty good um, for second place, but not enough to become the nominee for the Democrats in 2016. What happened to the other votes? Sorry? All the other guys. The other guys quit before. Um, the, the GOP one is more contentious. So let's talk about the GOP one or the Republican one. You need 1,200 to be able to become the nominee. What did Donald Trump get? 1,500. The closest to him was Ted Cruz, but about 600 delegates voting for him. Going no good so far. So here's what it's like. Let's pretend this is a state. This is the state of Kauai. And it has 10 delegates up for grabs. Which party are we doing? Democratic. We're doing a Democratic Party. So all of these guys are what? We're all Democrats, and we're all deciding which one of them is going to be the what? Democratic nominee. nominee. This state can send how many delegates to the national convention in the summer? It can send 10. So good so far. So what you're doing when you vote in these party elections, you're not casting your vote directly for Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. You're telling your state, you see all these delegates right here? These delegates are pledged to vote for Hillary Clinton if they get chosen to represent the state in the Democratic election. These 10 delegates are pledged to vote for who? Bernie Sanders. What you're doing during party elections is you are selecting which one of these delegates are we going to send to the national convention. Does that make sense? If we send these guys right here to the national convention, when they go there in the summer, who are they going to vote for? They're going to vote for Sanders. So that's 10 delegates votes for Sanders. And these guys stay home. Yeah, well, good so far. So that's what you're doing in party elections. What you're basically doing is you're trying to select which of the delegates are we going to send to the national convention during the summer. The Democrats do the same thing. It doesn't have to be, I'm sorry, the Republicans do the same thing. It doesn't have to be 10, it could be 15, it could be 12, it depends on what the Republican Party wants to give them. Uh, but what you're basically doing is you're trying, the state party's trying to figure out which one of the delegates are they going to send to the national convention. And again, how many of the delegates do you need to win? What's the goal? Majority. A majority. Are we good so far? Yes. All right, complication number one. When it comes to party elections, there's two types. There's primaries and there's caucuses. Each state, each state party is allowed to choose one of the methods to select which delegates are going to go. So these are the methods, there's two methods in which a state party selects um, the delegates. We can do it through primaries or we can do it through caucuses. Which one is the most common method? Primaries, primaries are the most common method. There's a few states that use caucuses, but the most common method is a primary. Anybody know what Texas has? Texas has both primary for the Democratic side and we also have a primary on the Republican side. Sometimes it could, it could be different. In some states, they have a Democratic caucus and they have a Republican primary. Those can get confusing. But in our state, very simple, both parties chose to choose the primary process to select which delegates are going to go. I'll tell you right now. All right, so here's the difference between the two. A primary, think of it as like a regular election. People that want to participate show up throughout the day they go to a voting booth and they privately cast their vote to whichever nominee they want to, um, they want to, whichever candidate they want the nomination to, to be given to. It's a closed ballot, secret ballot, you vote throughout the day. Voter turnout is usually higher in states that have primaries, so you need to remember that. Voter turnout is usually higher in states that have primaries. And you'll see why in a little bit. In states that use the caucus system, which about 14 states use, um, it's more of a discussion rather than an election. So what happens during a caucus is members or people that want to participate, they meet in a building and they arrange themselves according to the, the candidate that they support. So let's say this is a Republican caucus. People that support Donald Trump will place themselves on this side of the room, usually a gymnasium or a, um, a church People that support Ted Cruz will place themselves on that side of the room. People that support John Kasich, for example, will place themselves on that side of the room. And for four hours, to three to six hours, you discuss. 
why you believe that that candidate best represents the Republican Party, should get the nomination for the Republican Party. It, if any time during those three to six hours you get convinced that the other guy is better, you have to physically move yes. to the other side. If you leave too early, your vote doesn't count. At the end of a caucus, everybody vote, votes openly. Everybody knows where everybody stands. Unlike in a primary, yeah. you can show up whenever you want throughout the day, cash a ballot, then go leave. Here, you need to have, you need to stay there. There's a time commitment. There's a discussion that happens, and it's an open, informal voting. Anybody have any questions on that? So this one requires time commitment. The voter turnout is lower. Why is it lower? Check out his time, right? Not a lot of people are willing to give up that much time. Not a lot of people are willing to spend hours discussing about who the nominee should be. So the implication of this is who votes in a caucus? Usually people who are very devoted to their party. Because those are the only people that you can convince to show up. If you're very casual about being a Republican or very casual about being a Democrat, would you go there? No. Probably not, because the time commitment is so much. So the type of voter that caucuses attract are party diehards, people who are devoted to their party. Does that make sense for people? Anybody have any questions on that? All right, so that's the difference between a primary and a caucus. State parties have a choice between which one do they want to use to select um, the delegates that will go to the national convention. All right, next. How do we award those delegates? How do we allocate those delegates? So let's go back to the state of Kauai. How many delegates are up for grabs? There's 10 delegates. In the Democratic Party, they allocate delegates according to the proportional system. Depending on the amount of votes that you get in a primary or in a caucus, that's how many delegates are we going to send for you in the national convention. So look at this election right here. Hillary Clinton gets how many of the votes? She gets 50%. So let's say we have a caucus or a primary. She got 50% of the people in that primary or caucus to vote for her. How many did Bernie Sanders get? 30%. How many delegates are off for ground? How many delegates can we send again to the national convention? We can send 10. So what we do is we award delegates proportionally. What that means is, how many delegates are we going to send for Hillary Clinton? Five. We're going to take five of these guys, and we're going to send them in the summer to the National Convention. So that when they get there, they vote for who? Hillary Clinton. Does Bernie Sanders get something? Yes. Yes, he does, because it's proportional. How many delegates do we send for Bernie Sanders? Three. Three. So we're going to send these five people. We're going to send three people for Bernie Sanders. Three delegates. How many delegates are we going to send for this guy? One. One for O'Malley. How many for... Brad Pitt? <laughs> so we're going to send one delegate for Brad Pitt. It's proportional. So usually, this is what the Democratic Party uses. They use a proportional system. So these are the delegates that will attend the convention. No one good so far. What happens to these nine right here? They stay home, right? They don't get to attend the convention. So they can vote for anybody else, right? They actually vote for Usually, they're pledged to the candidate. They vow to vote for the candidate. There's a wrinkle to the system where they can vote for somebody else, but we're not going to talk about that. The Republicans, vote, a lot of their elections, or a lot of their party nominating elections, are winner takes all. Whoever gets the most votes gets all of the delegates. So let's take a look at this caucus or primary. Who won this caucus or primary? Trump, Trump did. He got most of the votes. So, how many delegates are we going to send for Donald Trump? All ten. All ten. All ten will be delegates that support him. So we're going to send all these ten guys to the national convention, the Republican National Convention. And during the convention, they will vote for who? Donald Trump. What happens to these guys over here? No, they stay home. Hey, this guy got 30%. Tucker's so got 30%. What happens to his delegates? Doesn't matter. What happens to the loser? They get what? They get nothing. Make sense? So the Republican Party, a lot of their states use a winner takes all. Some, some of their states use proportional, but most of their state parties use a winner takes all system. So we're like splitting the, uh, are 
Which one what did you prefer, sir? Because wouldn't there this is not for the real election. This is for who's going to be the nominee for the party. Uh, right? So which all of these guys are Republicans. They're competing against each other for the nomination. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is not a real election. This is done by the parties themselves. So if you look over here, look at the Republican side. Look at California. How many delegates are up for grabs in California? 172. Sorry. 172 delegates are up for grabs. How many was given to the winner, Donald Trump? 172. How many did we give to Cruz and Kasich and Rubio? We give them none. Because it's what? It's winner takes all. If you look at the Democratic side, we take a look at California. How many are up for grabs in California? 475 plus 71, right? We award 269 to Clinton, and they awarded 206 for Bernie Sanders. The loser still gets something, because it's what? Proportion. It's proportion. Does this make sense for people? Yes. Anybody confused? So each party does this. All right, complication number two. The party, the state party, can choose between a close or open primary or caucus, or a close or open, or an open or closed primary or caucus. There's a difference between the two. In states that do a closed primary or caucus, who are the only ones that are invited? The party. People who are registered for the party. So if your state has a closed Republican primary, who are the only ones allowed to participate? Registered. Voters who are registered to which party? Republican party. If you're not registered for the Republican party, you're not allowed to participate in their closed primary or caucus. You need to be registered to the party. Can a Democrat participate here? No. Not allowed to. All right. On the Democratic side, if it's closed, who's the only one allowed to participate? Only registered Democrats. So if you're not registered, if you're from the other party, or if you're an independent, or you affiliate with a third party, you're not allowed to participate. These guys don't get to participate at all. At least these guys get to attend their own parties. Uh, primary or caucus, they get to participate in that. If you're an independent and you live in a state with a closed primary or caucus, tough luck for you, you're not allowed to participate in any of that. Which is sad because usually the real election is determined by independents and is determined by moderates. But in states that have closed primaries or caucuses, independents are not allowed to participate. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Can you register for both of them? No. Mm -hmm. How do you they check? I'm not sure, actually. That's a good question. Because I'm not sure. Right. But in a state that has an open primary, like we do here in Texas, both parties have an open primary, any eligible voter is allowed to participate. So if this is a Republican open primary, can Republicans participate? Yes, yes they can. Can Democrats participate in a Republican yes. primary? Yes, they can. Even independents are able to participate in an open primary. Any questions about that? How do you register? I'm not sure. I'm not registered. Like you're right. All right. I think there's a website somewhere for the party. Is this open or Both are open. We both have an open panel. Anybody have any questions? So there's implications to this. If you live in a state with a closed primary, you know if you're a candidate and you want to win that primary, who do you need to appeal to? Your party. You need to appeal to your party. So Americans usually have a bell curve of ideologies. Most Americans are moderates. Most Americans have liberal and conservative values. There's very few that are ultra-liberal, liberal, and there's very few that are ultra-conservative. But if you live in a state with a closed primary, where only your party members are allowed to participate, if you're a candidate, do you want to be more ideological, or do you want to be more moderate? Ideological. You want to be more ideological. Because you're trying to appeal to who? Your party, Your party members. Make sense for people? Yes. Anybody have a question on that? If you are campaigning in a state that has an open primary, you know not only do you have to attract your own members, you have to attract some independents also. So do you want to be more ideological? Do you want to be more moderate? moderate. You want to be more moderate. Because if you're too ideological, if you're too conservative, for example, who are you going to turn off? 
you're going to turn off Democrats that might want to attend, and especially the independents that may want to that may want to participate. So you want to become a little bit more moderate. So it changes your strategy of how you attract voters. Any questions about an open and close and the implications of both? So in which one do you want to be more moderate? Open. Open, open. primary, because you need to attract who? All. All. You need to attract everyone, including independents. Here, you can be more ideological because you're only appealing to who? Your party members. Because you don't have to worry about independents because they don't, they're not allowed to participate. All right, don't do this, but I'm gonna tell you what happens. But don't do this. In an open primary, let's say in 2016, you're a staunch Donald Trump supporter. You're a Republican and you're a diehard Republican. And you want to you want Donald Trump to win. Why would you ever attend and participate in a Democratic primary? So you never vote for somebody you know is going to lose? There you go. So let's say in a recent poll it says if the Democrats choose Hillary Clinton as their nominee, Donald Trump has a chance of beating her. However, if Democratic Party nominates Bernie Sanders instead, Donald Trump is going to get crushed, according to the polls. What do you do? You go, you go to the Democratic primary or caucus, and you vote for which candidate? The weaker candidate. So that they choose a weaker nominee, so that when they get the nomination, your, your guy can beat that guy. Does that make sense? You don't do that ever, but that's what some people do. <laughs> All right, talk about early primaries and early caucuses, and this one is important. Um, during the election year, the beginning are belongs to the parties. They're doing their primaries and caucuses between January and May. The thing is, the primaries and the caucuses that take place over here in the early months of the year are more important than the ones that take place later on. Why? Because if you do well in the early contest, guess whose face is on TV? Your face is going to be on TV. If you do better than expected, it helps build momentum for your campaign. It helps voters get, it helps get their attention. And it helps them, it helps um, bring you to the voters. So doing better than expected in the early contest can help your campaign build momentum can put you in the television screens of Americans in the United States. That's why the media and the public usually pay attention in the beginning. Uh, doing winning can make you seem like you're the front runner and that you're the guy to beat. And that can help bring more voters to your side. You guys remember the bandwagon effect? Yes. People tend to support things that are what? Like, that, are, that are popular, right? That are successful. If you're successful in the early contest, People are going to think that you're the guy to beat, and they're, they're going to be more likely to support you. So doing well, doing better than expected, or maybe even winning the early contest, very important for campaigns. Campaigns that don't do too well, a lot of them have to drop out. Because they lose support, they lose money, and we lose a lot of good candidates in these early months of the party nominating elections. Because they lose support. So doing better, than expected, and winning these early ones, very crucial to a campaign. Um, you need to know which ones are first. The state that does the first caucus is who? Which state does the first caucus? Virginia. They do it in January. California. Texas. Iowa. It's called the Iowa caucus. Next year, you're going to hear that a lot during January and February, there you're gonna hear the term Iowa caucus a lot. Who, want, who's, who does the first primary? Texas. Oh, Iowa. Virginia. Yeah. Pennsylvania. Oh, Massachusetts. So we have, the first caucus is Iowa, the one that does the first primary is New Hampshire, the yeah. New Hampshire primary. So the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary. To give you an idea how important this is, no Republican has ever won the nomination for his party without winning one of these. That's how important these are. Sure, where is Iowa? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is it right here somewhere? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 you got me 
there. It's for sure, like, in the lines. It's underneath. So here's the thing that you need to realize. Iowa and New Hampshire are very small states. In the real election, they don't have a lot of electoral votes. They're very inconsequential in the election in November. They only matter, the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary only matters because why? Because they're the first one. Because they're the first one. They're the ones that starts it off. They're the one that sets up who's the guy to beat, who are the candidates that have a chance, and who are the candidates that don't have a chance. That's why they're important. That's why the media and the public is tuned into Iowa, and they're tuned into New Hampshire in the beginning of the primary and caucus season. Anybody have any questions? Is there like a specific order on how they do it? Like so in, not really, but in New Hampshire's constitution, their state constitution, they said that we're always going to be two weeks before everybody else. Which is going to present a problem if another state decides to do the same thing and it's going to be an infinite loop. Alright, so after all the caucuses and the primaries are done, they're usually done by May. In the summer, we have the what? What do we have in the summer? Party conventions. Party national conventions. The party national conventions. Who attends the convention? The delegates. The delegates that were selected during the primaries and the caucuses. So they're the ones that are going to attend. And they're going to vote for whoever they're pledged to vote. How do you win again? You need to get how many of those delegates to vote for you? The majority. majority of those delegates to vote for you. So this is like a week-long thing. And at the very end, they announce who's going to be the nominee for the party. It's like a big pep rally for the party. Obviously, whose convention is this right here on the picture? The OP. Republican. The Republican Party. There's like an orgasm of balloons, celebrity guests. Uh, at the very end, the nominees for president and vice president are announced. It used to be conventions are more exciting because we didn't know who the nominee is going to be. because Nobody's counted it yet. But nowadays, we know weeks before the convention who's going to be the nominee because the delegates are already accounted for. Um, so it's not a surprise anymore. So I'm going to show you a democratic convention. And this is when the delegates cast their votes for the nominee. So usually what happens is they do it per state, and then they brag about their state first, and then they do the vote.
They can decide with state laws to do what? Uh, primary or caucus. They, the state parties do that. They can run the elections. Yeah. They can make it harder or easier for someone to what? Right. To vote, right? What? Give me things that would make it easier for somebody to vote. A state legislature can, can make oh, somebody same day registration. Same day registration, early voting, all that stuff makes it easier for somebody to vote. Give me a state law that makes it harder for someone to vote. Registration, photo ID laws. Those are decided at the state level. 
So these people that nobody cares about, they decide how hard it is or how easy it is to vote in the state. And that affects how that has an impact on presidential elections. Usually, the more people that are allowed to vote, the more people that can vote, the easier the voting process in a state. That's better for which candidate? The Democrat or the Republican? Democrat. It's better for the Democrat. Because more minorities will be voting, and more college students are going to be voting, which is something that, which are demographics that usually support the Democrat. The less people that vote, the harder it is to vote in a state, the more beneficial it would be for the Republican candidate. Anybody have a question on that? So state elections have an impact on presidential elections because state elections will determine who's going to be serving in the Texas Congress. And the Texas Congress passed state laws that can make it harder or more easier to vote, which can affect presidential elections. Will you be in voting against the choice? I mean, you don't think they can choose in some state. states, you are allowed to mail in your vote. Makes the whole process more convenient. In Texas, you can mail in your registration, but you're not allowed to. You need to take time out of your day to actually go vote. Oh, okay. does Texas have same same day registration? We do not have same day registration, so don't expect. And, and you don't have one of those in your state. All right. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about how you actually win the election. How do you actually become the president of the United States? Right now, what did we just do? We <laughs> uh, get the nomination. What's the goal again? Majority. <laughs> you get the majority of what? Delegates that would be attending what? Party convention in the summer. Um, how do state parties, what are their choices in how they select the, the delegates? What are the two it's ways? Primaries. 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 primaries and? Caucuses. caucuses. Which one is like a regular election where you vote throughout the primary. primary? Primary caucuses are open meetings. How do you vote? Uh, by standing in the public. Do you vote openly? Right? Why are there less people that attend caucuses? More time commitment. commitment. There's, there's more time commitment. So who usually attends caucuses or participates in caucuses? Oh, die hard party people, die hard people who are devoted for their party. All right, so here's a question that might be in touch. Look at your guys. We may have a quiz. We have time. Look at the board. All right. What are the implications of that? Since party diehards are the ones that usually no participate in a caucus, how would you strategize if you're a candidate? Do you want to be more moderate or do you want to be more ideological in a, in a caucus? Ideological. 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 Because you know the people participating are diehard about their party. That make sense? Yes. What are the two ways in which we can allocate the delegates to the candidates? Proportional and winner takes all. Winner takes all. Winner takes all is usually which party? You usually the Republican. 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 Which means that whoever wins the election, it doesn't matter by how much, they're awarded how many of the delegates? All of them. Uh, all of the delegates. So in the Republican Party, all of these guys are the ones that get sent to the convention because he won, the rest go home. That's they don't get to us. Yes. In the Democratic side, they use a proportional system. It depends on the proportion of the votes that you've got. That's how many of the delegates they're going to send. That makes sense for people. Anybody confused by that? No. So, uh, the Who's like in the party that chooses for each state? Like, they're gonna the state play. leaders usually. The party leaders in each state usually choose. All right, what's the difference between a closed and open primary or caucus? Who's the only ones that allowed to attend in a closed primary or caucus? Registered party, 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 party members. In open primaries, who are allowed to attend? Anybody. Anybody. Where do you become more moderate in if you're a candidate? Oh, open. Open. Because you know you need to appeal to who? Everyone. Everyone, including independents. Here, you need to be more what? Ideological. Ideological because you're only appealing to who? Your party, party, your party, party, party members because yeah. nobody else is allowed to participate. Which one gets more voter turnout? An open primary or closed open. primary? Open. Open. open primary. Does that make sense? Yes. Why are early primaries important? Because they help a campaign build what? Momentum. Momentum. If you do well, you're going to get more attention. You're going to get more support from the American public. What happens if you become the winner? You become the what? No, 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 no. In the early ones, oh. you don't know, automatically front become, runner. You become the front runner. You're the guy to be. First primary is what? What's the first Iowa. primary? New Hampshire. First caucuses. Hampshire, Iowa. First caucuses Iowa. Iowa. So remember, New Hampshire primary, Iowa caucus, always the first ones. I That's see. why they get a lot of they get a lot of attention from the media. So for four months or five months, we're doing primaries and caucuses. Again, the first ones are Iowa and New Hampshire. By June, what do we do? The party, the party, party conventions. 
Who attends the conventions? Delegates. The delegates. delegates that were chosen by the primaries and the caucus um, system. Are all caucuses open? No, most of them are closed. Oh. So, most, most caucuses are closed. So. All right, anybody have any questions? No. All right, you have homework tonight. Yes. And you